My name is Marjorie O'Toole. I see lots of familiar faces and I'm happy to see you this evening. I'm the direct, I'm the, <laughs> Marilyn, I'm the executive director of the Little Compton Historical Society and I'm one of the people working on our first permanent exhibition in about 40 years. So this is a very exciting thing. Um, and the last permanent exhibition was the Portuguese Room in the 1970s. Um, and uh, this one is going to be all about farming. Um, we have not settled on a title, so I don't have a snazzy title yet to share with you. Um, so we're just sort of calling it the Big Barn Project. Um, but by the time it opens in July, it'll have a, a nice title and um, be all set and ready to go. So I'm going to share my screen. And again, just in case anybody joined at the last minute, I'm going to run through some slides um, very quickly, very casually. And then at the end, we welcome your questions and comments. Um, it, if you put your questions in the chat and send them to Jenna, she'll share them with me um, at the end. Uh, today is a day where I'm going to do most of the talking. Um, next week, we have, next week and the following week, we have five or six Zoom conversations where community members will be doing the talking. So if you are a farmer or if you have farming memories, even from way back when you were a kid, next week and the following week are your opportunities to share those memories with us. We really encourage you to do that and we'll tell you how to sign up for those at the end. All right, so let's screen share. Right, so I took this beautiful picture yesterday, our big barn project, um, and its point is to share the story of local farming. Um, and before we sort of get into the details of what we're gonna do, all right, so this is one of those things where, there. Um, so why farming? And I think for, for any of us who are familiar with Little Compton, why farming is, really sort of a uh, an unnecessary question you know those of us who've been around for even a short period of time know that Little Compton is still very much a farming community and it's very clear that its roots as a farming community run very deep back to the time of the Sakonet people certainly the first English settlers um, and we've been doing an awful lot of research, or we're starting to do some, some new research to confirm old work. Um, and everything we're seeing is confirming that farming was still important um, and still prominent, the most prominent um, occupation in Little Compton well into the 20th century. So why this particular building? You know, we own this beautiful, um, we call it the 19th century barn or the big barn. We own this big, beautiful barn. Um, it was original to the property. It originally was only two thirds its size and it sat much closer to the Wilbur house. Um, and it was built by Wilbur family members around 1820. A hundred years later in 1920, Manuel Dialmo, an Azorian immigrant, um, moved the barn to its present location away from the house. He put a, he made it a basement underneath it and he transformed it into a commercial dairy barn. So, um, and then the, Mr. D'Almo rented it to the Brownell family for Brownell Roses. I think we have some people in the audience who used to work for Brownell Roses. Um, and then in the 19, and I have to look up the date because I don't know, in 1970s, the Historical Society purchased the barn and began using it as its um, agricultural display area. And for many years, it really was more of a storage area, open to the public, but a storage area for our agricultural collection. It wasn't terribly... Um, interpreted. There wasn't a lot of text for people to read and understand and come out of the building with any kind of understanding of a story. And that's exactly what 
we want to do is help people understand the story of farming in Little Compton as they move through that building. Um, the big barn tends not to get a lot of attention. It needed a little bit of love and we've been happy to be able to do that. We've had a carpenter in there. We've had an exterminator in there. Um, it's going to be a much improved, better preserved building as a result of this project. And why do we wanna do this project right now? It really, it's way more ambitious than what we normally do. It's way more expensive than what we normally do. So why would we do that in the middle of a, of a, of a pandemic? In large part, we're doing it because of the pandemic. Because if, some, if things are still not good this summer and we put all our time and effort into a special exhibition, there's a real chance that that effort would be lost. People wouldn't be able to come see the special exhibition um, if it was a one year thing. But because this is a permanent project, even if things don't go well this summer, even if our visitation is poor this summer, because it's permanent and, and you know, permanent, what does permanent mean? 20 years, 25 years. Um, this exhibit will have a nice long life. Thousands of people will get to enjoy it. So we feel as though our time and effort will not be wasted because even if it's not fully enjoyed this year, it can be fully enjoyed next year once we're all in a safer place. So how are we gonna do this? Um, we've been working on it since the early fall. We, we brought in an exhibit designer to help give us some ideas. And the reason why this how question is here is as part of her visit, she asked a question, a really important question that I've been thinking about ever since. And she said it in a very kind, very nice way. But basically she said, you know, agricultural exhibits, agricultural museums all over the country are struggling. You know, they're not doing very well. It's considered kind of old fashioned. Some of them are closing what are you gonna do differently here to ensure that your agricultural exhibit, your new agricultural exhibit actually succeeds where all these others are failing? Um, that's a hard question. And it really made me think, it made other members of the committee think. Um, I think part of the reason why we know this is gonna succeed is because of the community we live in. You know, a, a farming community with a deep interest in farming we are telling community stories. And I think that's gonna res resonate with our 21st century audience. So we're gonna focus on the stories of farming, um, you know, rather than the, the stuff of farming. We have some wonderful stuff. You're gonna see wonderful stuff in the exhibition, but this is not an exhibition about the 27 different plows that farmers used. This is gonna be an exhibition about the people who were using those plows. Um, the Wilbur family, immigrants, um, all people, you know, other farms throughout Little Compton and Adamsville. Adamsville is certainly part of Little Compton. And I think uh, audience members are gonna see um, and be able to connect to people from the community, from the past and the present, because we are going to also um, tell the story of farming in Little Compton today um, through a short film. And I think we're gonna succeed because we're asking and we seriously um, are interested in and are relying on community input. And I think when the community helps with a project, that project has a very good chance of succeeding. Okay. So what are we planning? There's a bunch of different components here. Physical work on the barn, work on the exhibit, public programs. We always like to add to our archive as part of a project. And we're, especially thanks to Jenna, we're getting really good at adding to our online resources. Um, and then also what are we planning for community input? So the barn is probably the most straightforward and that work started back in the fall. So the barn is getting cleaned. It's getting culled or curated. So we're looking into a, a, the picture that we have here now. Um, 
this is after an awful lot of cleaning and culling. Um, and even that, that wooden um, piece in the back has, has been removed. But in that corner, when we started, there were 11 whiffle trees. So whiffle trees are a, a stick that helps connect animals to a cart. Um, we had 11 of them and that was the whiffle tree corner. Um, whiffle trees are nice, but we didn't really think that our visitors needed to see 11 whiffle trees when they came to visit the exhibit. So those are now safely in storage and we have some nice, clean, uncluttered space where we can put things like exhibit panels or more interesting objects to help tell the stories we want to tell. Things are getting reorganized. We've done a lot of critter proofing. Uh, our carpenter figured out where the bats were coming in. Our carpenter figured out where the squirrels were coming in. And we think we've outsmarted them, at least for the time being. Um, we're bringing everything up to code. We're improving the ventilation in the building. Um, you know, anyone who's a real New Englander and I, I didn't know this, I had to learn this. Um, you don't shingle a whole building at once. You only shingle the walls that really need shingling. So we're gonna shingle the east wall of the building and we're gonna paint the front doors and the trim. So it'll look, um, it'll look very nice um, when we open in July. Uh, we're adding a security system in this building, which is a big deal for us. And I think the biggest deal of all is that we're going to put a handicap access ramp on the front of the building. Um, and I, 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 love, I love the fact that we're able to do this for this building um, because sometimes it's hard to do for historic buildings, but it should work really well here. And through it all, we're going to work very hard to try and find the right balance between barn and museum. We want you to feel like you're in a barn when you're in this space. Um, but we also want you to feel like we've taken some real time and effort to create a nice, professional, engaging exhibition for you. So some of the work that's been done on the barn, again, started in the fall. Um, this was one of my favorite days ever at the Wilbur House. It was carriage moving day. Um, we decided to reorganize the carriages in the in the big barn and swap them with one of the carriages, do a swap um, between the big barn carriage and the parents carriage. And so in order to do that, everything had to get moved out and then moved back in. And we did that with volunteers on a very cold day this fall. And it was so much fun. So you see our Wilbur store carriage, which will still be part of the exhibition, just had to get moved out of the way. This very fancy, literally a New York carriage is getting put in the carriage house. Fred Bridge here in the green was the master of ceremonies that day. So the fancy Wilbur carriage from New York is going in the carriage house. And in return, we took out the Isaac Wilbur carriage, um, which was actually owned by a little Compton farmer and will help us tell the story of gentlemen farmers in Little Compton. It takes up much less space than the other carriage and really clears up uh, a nice open space for visitors. And there it is. And you can see, you know, definitely a work in progress. We have all these beautiful agricultural images and all these nice big empty walls. And we wanna fill the walls with images that'll help us understand farming from the past. So these are some of the things that we some of the images we'll be choosing from. The things that we took out of the big barn are now safely stored elsewhere on the property. This is sort of an intermediary step where things were just sort of resting before they were put into their final locations, um, either um, in different spots along the wall or on the shelves. But um, our exhibit committee wanted to make sure that we were not getting rid of things, not throwing things away willy-nilly, and we certainly didn't do that. We disposed of only a very small number of things that were actually um, broken or damaged beyond repair and um, simply restored, rehoused most of the things in the barn that um, were duplicates and, and not necessary for the new exhibit. It gave us a much airier, open, uncluttered uh, feeling in the big barn. 
And again, all this big, beautiful wall space where we can put exhibit panels to tell the story of farming. Again, nice big open space. We're very excited that we're going to put a, um, a giant TV screen up here and show some films uh, in the exhibition, one on the history of farming, one on present day farming. And I think that's gonna add an awful lot to the exhibition. Some of the carpentry work is cosmetic. Um, here's some plywood on one of the barn floors. The carpenter was able to strengthen the floor from underneath and remove the plywood. So it's a much more attractive space. And he's also um, gonna help us with this wall over here so that in the end it matches this wall over here and we'll just make a, a much nicer presentation for the public. The Portuguese room is on the second floor of the big barn. It will continue to be on the second floor of the big barn and it's gonna get a good cleaning and a little reorganization. Um, but the Portuguese room was redone in 2009 and it's the, the information in that room is still quite good and quite up to date. So then the X, so that's the barn. So then the exhibition, we're going to show and label and talk about our most interesting agricultural objects. We're gonna use historic images from the collection. We're gonna create exhibit panels that are attractive to look at, easy to read, and the information on those panels is gonna be very well researched and presented. We're gonna use those short films, again, one on the history and one on the present day. Um, and we want to tell really engaging stories. We did work with an exhibit designer, um, Aaron Wells, Aaron Wells Design, who helped us think through um, some of the design elements of the project. It was very helpful talking with her. She gave us, you know, good insight into, you know, making displays that seemed dynamic. Um, exciting, combining interesting objects with exhibit panels and large images. And we'll be working on that in the spring. Again, all these great big empty walls, you know, just begging to be filled with the, some of the beautiful farming images in our collection. Like these and this, we're moving through time here. That's Jane Cabot's mother with some horses. And those are some Peckham kids with some beautiful blue Hubbard squash. So we have some beautiful images in our collection, interesting images, and we're asking community members to share other images with us um, now so that we might be able to use them in the exhibit as well, either on an exhibit panel or perhaps in one of the films. Again, now, work in progress. Right, we're definitely not done. We still have lots more work to do, but just to give you a sense of the process, these bright blue papers are different topics, different subject matters, and we're starting to organize our artifacts around those subject matters. Display cases, these are the old display cases. We've emptied them, we've moved them out. We may use them, we may not use them. They definitely, if we use them, they need a little refurbishment, but we'll be working all that out um, in the coming months. The second floor of the barn, if anyone's ever had the opportunity to be in there, is quite different. It actually, so the Portuguese room is in this area over here, and then it, there are six bays. And in each of those bays, um, Carlton was responsible for collecting these are items associated with a particular trade. And many of these trades are connected to farming, things that a farming family would do in order to supplement their income, um, weaving. And this is the, uh, a, boot, a bay with all sorts of things relating to textiles, lots of stuff. So you see, we have our work cut out trying to organize this into something that is attractive and makes sense. Um, not all the bays are quite that cluttered. This is dairying. So the making of butter and cheese, which was really important um, for the family income. 
this is an interesting section where we have a little bit on a lot of different subjects. So we've got shoemaking, um, which we know Jonathan Wilbur was a shoemaker in addition to being fa a farmer. We have blacksmithing and we have Dr. White's diphtheria medicine. And, you know, so what does Dr. White's diphtheria medicine have to do with farming? Well, the Brownells, a farming family, purchased the recipe for Dr. White's medicine and made it on their farm as a way to supplement their income. Carpentry and fishing. And I just wanna point out a couple of the objects. We've got the lighthouse lens. We've got this interesting little trap over here. And our challenge is to take this sort of grouping of objects and as the designer suggests, create a display that is clear and concise and attractive and will actually be able to convey information to visitors using the objects, using nice large photographs and using text panels. And that's gonna be our project, that's our work for the coming weeks and months. One of our challenges is we have a lot of brown things, brown things, brown walls, and so color will be very important uh, in the exhibition. The exhibit designer, uh, the, the consultant helped us with some color studies. Our own designer, Shelley Bowen, has taken that a step further with some palettes, and we're just about to do some experimentation with different colors um, as backgrounds for the objects. So that'll be a fun, a fun project for us. So what are the stories that we want to tell? First of all, we want to make sure that we're very clear that agriculture in, in this area started with the Sakonic people. We also want to explore the idea that everyone was a farmer. And what I mean by that is that we want to expand our understanding of farming um, from just the landowner, the male landowner, to everyone in the household contributing to the family business, um, to wealthy gentlemen and gentle lady farmers to poor farmers, um, enslaved people, indentured people of different races working on these farms, immigrants working on the farms. Some are visitors and you say, well, you know, some are visitors, they're on vacation, they're not farming. When we read their letters, when we read what they've left behind and look at their photographs, not all of their summer, and this is, these are the early visit, visitors, you know, right around 1900. They were play farming. They would have animals down here. They would have crops, you know, vegetable gardens and things down here. And that was part of their fun to get out of the cities and do some of this agricultural stuff uh, while they spent the summer here. Um, and then the 20th century. When did farming stop being the most dominant industry in the community? When did we shift to more of a bedroom community? Um, and, and now that we're in the 21st farming, 21st century, what does farming look like today? One point that we really want to make is that, oh, pardon me, people were farmers and. So even back in the 1600s, you were a farmer and a surveyor, or a farmer and a blacksmith. And how long did that multiple occupation um, trend last in the community? We wanna talk about markets. Where did these products go? There is sort of this myth about Little Compton farming and New England farming that these folks were you know, just trying to make ends meet. They were subsistence farming. They just, they just grew food for themselves. That, is true maybe for the very poorest of people, but it's not true for the majority of the community. Um, you know, anybody above the poverty line, their whole point was to grow products and get them to market. So where were those markets? Newport, New Bedford, and, and you know, maybe surprisingly on ships that went all over the Atlantic world. There's the theme of going from uniformity to uniqueness. Early on, 
you know, in the 18th century, the farms were really all the same. Um, sheep farms, flax farms, a little bit of dairy, corn, hay, very, very similar from one farm to another. At the end of the 20th century, there was a trend toward, well, actually starting in the end of the 19th century, you see individual farmers trying something special. You know, George Gray, who lived in the Middendorf's farm across the street from the Wilbur House, he became a specialist in growing grapes. Um, Irving Bailey's farm specialized in sending vegetables to New York City. So we start to see specialization and that is what has carried forth into the 21st century with all the small specialty farms we have today. We love barns. We want to learn more about the barns that are the antique barns that are standing and what people are doing with them today. How are these barns going to survive into a new century? What, what new lives are they going to have? And we definitely want to make the point that farming is alive and well today. And what does farming look like today? How is it different from the past? Um, when we were talking about summer visitors farming, my little, my boxes of people are hiding this photograph, but this is a picture of Henry Demarest Lloyd, who was a um, very prominent newspaper owner from Chicago. And he had a farm uh, at, at Sakonet Point and all of his guests would work on the farm when they came to visit. He's got a, buck, a basket of corn on his head in the photograph. So what kind of public programs are we going to offer this year? July is up in the air and we're not going to commit, we can't commit at this point to in-person special events in July. But we do know we're going to open the exhibit, even if we open it like we did last year by appointment to small groups. So starting in July, you will be able to see this new exhibition. We're going to kick things off with a virtual opening and a video tour. And then that video tour will go online so that people anywhere would be able to enjoy the new exhibit. We'll have a virtual lecture series. We're wondering whether or not we can have an in-person annual meeting in August and we'll, we'll think about that later. In the fall, we're very hopeful that we will be back to in-person events, even if there are some guidelines when we have them. And in partnership with the Ag Trust, we're very excited about the possibility of a farm tour where people would be able to visit um, <clears throat> willing, <laughs> certainly wouldn't press this on anybody who doesn't want to do it, but farmers who are willing to open their operation up to the public for a special day. And either on a different day or perhaps the same day, a farm and trade showcase back at the Wilbur House. Um, we're also really looking forward to inviting school children to the new exhibit. Um, you may or may not know that we offer all of our programs, all of our school programs are free to students at the Wilbur School. Um, and so these would be free school tours to any grade at Wilbur School who would be interested in coming. And we certainly want to reach out um, if, if any of the high school teachers are interested, you know, we would, from Portsmouth, we would welcome them as well. I'm sorry, I'm just having a little trouble advancing my slide here. There we go. Um, so community input. We want people with farming memories. We want people who are farming now to do oral histories with us. We have an intern who is going to do oral histories for us. Um, and, and if he can't handle the volume, we will do some ourselves. We want community members to please think about what objects they may have, images they may have, documents they may have that might help us with this subject matter. Um, and especially with the images and documents, they can be digital. You don't have to part with your original photographs. We can, a, a digital image will work beautifully for us. Over the course of the summer, we're going to create a film on farming today in Little Compton with interviews with people who are farming today. So if you are farming, if you know of someone who is farming, we would really like to connect with you 
and um, and talk about um, getting you into that film. Again, we want to have a farm tour. We want to have the farm and trade show. It's like a marketplace at the Wilbur House. And community input, we certainly could use some financial help this year. Um, this project is about three times as expensive as what we normally do. And we are going to be looking for sponsors and donors. And we'll be sending out a fundraising letter in the next couple of weeks asking for help. Community conversations are coming up next week. These are going to be very small Zoom chats, no more than 12 people. I won't be talking, I'll just be facilitating and we'll give the participants um, a chance to speak and share their, um, their memories, their experiences with farming. A couple of different subject matters, you can see them here a couple of different times for each one. If you are willing, and we're gonna limit it to no more than 12 people in any one of these conversations. If you're willing to take part in one of these conversations, um, please send me an email at the email you see here on the screen. Give us a call at the office, or you can put your contact information in the chat and Jenna will write that down. Um, just specify which talk you'd like to take part in. And even if you feel like you don't have anything to share, you can still help us with this project by thinking about the people you know in the community, your neighbors and your friends who may have a connection to agriculture, who may be helpful to us, um, and please try to recruit them. You know, share the contact information with them, invite them to take part in the community conversations. Just pick up the phone and give us a call. Um, and, you know, we, those connections, that wonderful information comes in very surprising and wonderful ways. Um, this image, Only Love Beats Milk, was sent to me today by um, Christine Aguiar, who is a, who is a goulart. And this is um, an image uh, advertising piece that Fran Lott Farm, the Goulart Farm, used in the 1970s. Um, and it's really wonderful. And, you know, the exhibit is going to come right up to the present day. So this is, a, this is a perfect image to use in the exhibition. All right. Um, Jenna, if there's anybody with any questions, um, I'm more than happy to try and answer them now. There are not yet. Um, if you are looking for how to enter your questions, uh, if you're on a desktop computer, the chat button is in the bottom bank of buttons um, towards the center. If you're on a mobile device, you'll have to hit the more button in the top corner to be able to select chat. I see some farming folk on here today and um, you know, we don't want to make pests of ourselves, but we're going to be in touch with you. We, you know, we want you to give us an oral history. We want you to show up in that film that we do um, this summer, which will be very professionally done. Um, and the Ag Trust is calling for, th for themselves, the Ag Trust is calling this the year of the farmer. So we're really happy to be able to partner with them uh, with their year of the farmer and our permanent exhibition on farming, I think those two things just mesh together beautifully. And uh, we can really give the subject of farming, you know, the attention that it's due this year. And again, because this is a permanent exhibition, carry that forward into the future. So I do have a message. Amy Corbett sent me a message. Are there items in the barn that no one could identify? So there, the short answer is yes. There's some things we're not super sure about. Um, labeling the things in the barn was the last thing Carlton Brownell did before he became too frail to come to the Historical Society. So working on the barn was Carlton's last project. Um, he was very dedicated to it. He would drive his little 
pickup truck right up to the door of the barn, go in, work by hand, handwritten notes. And then I had um, this wonderful high school intern turn those notes into labels. So most of the items in the barn are labeled with what Carlton knew them to be. So, and, and often he knew who donated them. So that's very helpful. But there are things that, that weren't labeled and we look at them and we're like, oh, what could it be? I've been putting a couple of them online and like the online universe has been identifying them for us. Um, there's this one, it's, it's this long skinny box. It's got to be 15 feet long. It's a seed spreader that one human being would put around his neck and carry with him over the fields to spread seed. You'd look at it and you'd, you'd say, oh, it's, it's just not possible. But, you know, that's exactly what it was for. And I believe it was used on, I hope I'm not telling lies, but I think it was used on Goosewing Farm. And I think um, Dora Milliken is the one who added it to the collection. So there will be some weird stuff in the exhibit, um, all of it labeled. This is a little, a little gross. But this is the thing that every single kid who goes through the exhibit will remember and come out talking about. Um, and this is labeled. We have something called the cow vomit rope. So it's a big thick rope with a knot in it. And I, I don't know much about raising cows, but apparently the way their stomachs work, they can um, sort of, you know, eat something and make themselves sick to the point where they'll die if you don't help them. So farmers would shove this rope down their throat to make them up chuck, and that would save their lives. Um, now, someone on the committee doesn't think that's true, but if Carlton said it, <laughs> that's good enough for me. <laughs> and it's a, really, it's a really good story. It's a really fun object. And, and I, I promise you, that's the thing your eight-year-old's going to remember when, when he or she leaves the exhibition. Um, we have a couple questions. Are you aware that there are new old barn stamps at the post office? I know, and we're going to order some. I think they're postcard stamps, which is a little bit disappointing because we don't use those as much as some of the other stamps, but we do use them for membership cards. So I think you'll be seeing barn stamps on your new membership cards. Um, are we considering having school children from outside of Little Compton come see the exhibit as part of a grant opportunity? Yes, and not even necessarily as a grant opportunity. Um, you know, quite frankly, if there's a group from Tiverton who wants to come or Westport who wants to come and we need to, you know, negotiate on price and figure out a way to make it possible for them to come, you know, we're gonna make that happen. We, um, we as an organization are uh, much happier when people come see our work, um, regardless of the income. Um, so we'll make that happen. Um, do stories and anecdotes have to be related specifically to Little Compton or can they be immediately surrounding areas? That's tricky. I should say just Little Compton, but sometimes we fudge if it's a really good story. So yeah. we'll have to we'll have to hear the story and decide if it's worth fudging. Um, Grace McKivergan would like to point out that there's also a dung beater. Yes, the dung beater is hung prominently on the wall, and the dung beater will be part of the permanent exhibition, and it'll be the second most remembered thing by children who go through the exhibition. <laughs> Helen has part of a message through but only part there is an old barn program available online um, through Preserve Rhode Island which I think you had attended but is are you saying that there is a recording of it that's accessible Helen hold on I'm gonna un I'm just gonna unmute you <laughs> it's easier that way I believe that um it's available at least on Maine Preservation's website and probably whatever the New Hampshire one, which was the host, 
So I'm sure it's available um, to view uh, remotely and it's all about old barns and um, I'll, Jenna, I'll try to send you one link that will work, but I think there are plenty um, because it was very widely supported by all the preservation um, organizations in New England. So um, one of the one of our viewers, um, one of our participants sent me a message, how much money do we need to raise in order to be successful? So a bare bone, bare bones budget where we can do something nice and presentable, about $65,000, um, not counting staff time. But to do everything we want to do, to, to not cut corners, to not pinch pennies, it's more of a $100,000 project. Jenna, do you have more questions? I do not currently know. Um, but I do have the link to the stamp out barn loss that Helen was talking about. It's in the chat. And if you scroll through, there is a section that says, please enjoy and share the recording that if you click on it, will get you to the recorded conversation. All right. Okay. So, so, oh, Wendy Merriman would like to say something. Can you unmute her? Jenna, do you see her on yes, your screen? Yes, I can. Okay. We'll be with you in a second, Wendy. You should get a prompt to unmute yourself, Wendy. But you have to hit a button so that you can, there, good. Okay. Perfect. I had to leave because I got a call. Um, I'm wondering because I'm in Tiverton and on the Little Compton line with the Peckham family, are they and with their history there, is that included in Little Compton? Or does that remain in Tiverton or is it a mix? Well, I know for sure. I grew up on West Main Road right in front of Saconnet Vineyards, and I know the fields across the way were either potato fields or sometimes squash fields worked by the Peckham family. So the, you know, that branch of the Peckham family has land in Little Compton, has farmed in Little Compton, and I would definitely like to include their stories. Because I, um, I, didn't, I didn't know about tonight until I got your newsletter, but I didn't include Pete, but um, I just, um, just didn't know. We'll reach out. My, my dad used to work for them, so um, that's actually a part of my childhood was going and playing on their swing set with, with their kids. <laughs> so we'll reach out. And it, you know, it's funny because I wouldn't recognize them now as adults, but um, it was very fun to go to their house. Um, so we'll reach out to them and, and see what they, they have to offer for sure. And he might be very interested in the project that you're doing. And, and, you know, we're saying farming, I want to, it's, it's agriculture, right? So Peckham's greenhouse is agriculture. Yeah. Um, you know, the young man, uh, Tim Wetzel in Adamsville, who's growing mushrooms, that's agriculture. Um, Pete Melanson, Peter Melanson has an oyster farm. Well, is it fishing? Is it farming? You know, I'm really happy to talk to Pete and find out more about it. And you know, why can't we, why can't we raise that question in the exhibition? Is this what, you know, has farming moved into the, into the river? Okay, I've got a couple more questions for you. Um, what portion of the budget that you mentioned is for videos? I think about 6,000. And these are, these are, um, in some cases, rough estimates, you know, we'll, we'll learn more as we go. But I think in the last grant that I wrote, I was 6,000. Are there barns that we know of that are about to fall apart in Little Compton, ones that are on the verge of loss? Um, 
I would assume the answer is yes. I can't really, you know, I can't name any off the top of my head, but you know, me, we all know maintaining buildings is very expensive. Um, it, it would be nice to get a, a sense of that, a hold on that um, this year. I'm also very interested in finding out what people have done to rescue and preserve their barns. I know um, of at least two that have been turned into beautiful gathering places. Um, you know, we see some being used as houses. It would be really kind of neat to, to track that as well. How will you measure success? <laughs> this is like an interview level question. Yeah, well, that's a grant, that's a grant question. Um, it, so often with our projects, um, we know we're successful anecdotally by the way people respond. We, we count admission, that matters. But it, often it's the little things like repeat visits, um, people who come a second time with their house guests, um, people who walk in the door and say things like, oh, you know, Jane Smith told me I had to come see this exhibit. Those are the sorts of things that really convince us that this is a particularly good exhibition. Um, evaluation is a hard thing. Um, the exhibit designer, the Erin Wells, um, has some expertise in that. And I think we would like to, again, pending the availability of funds, I think we would like to enlist Erin's help in um, some surveys and evaluation so that the audience can tell us um, how successful we are and hopefully, um, you, you know, sort of partway through the project too, so that we can shift gears if we need to in certain directions. I have a question. What about the gardens? Do you have, an, do you have enough to go off of there or should I possibly unmute so, the person? So our gardens, agriculture. Sakonic um, gardens, I'm sorry. Oh, Sakonic gardens. Um, I would consider Sakonic gardens part of the new agricultural work in Little Compton. I would welcome them on the farm tour. I would welcome their input. I, I know Michael was on the talk earlier. I'm, I don't see him at the moment. Oh, I do see him. Um, yeah, I mean, so this is, um, and he's waving, you know, just like we wanna be, I wanna be very broad in who is a farmer who's doing agricultural work. I think especially in who's farming today, it's like who's doing agricultural work today. You know, what, what work has its roots in farming might look a little different today, but you know, what has that old fashioned farming morphed into uh, in the 20th century, 21st century? The Save the Barns program also mentioned other agricultural buildings like corn cribs. Is that Part of the research? So we have a corn crib. We also have a chicken cook house, which was not used to cook chickens, but it was used to cook food for chickens because our chickens were so precious that they needed cooked food. Um, and yes, those are parts of the bigger project. So we'll have matching exhibition panels on those buildings that tell the story of use of those buildings. Okay. I don't have any more questions and I don't see anybody who's frantically trying to tap away at their screen. So I think we are good for tonight. All right. Well, it was so nice. Um, so nice seeing you. And I, I appreciate it if you leave your video on because it's so nice to see faces. Right. <laughs> 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 I think this weekend I, I was home for four three days without, well, my family, but you know, three days sort of at home. Last weekend was four days at home. It's really nice to see, uh, see more than just my tiny little circle. So thank you for tuning in.
please stay tuned about the project. Um, if you um, have some agricultural stories to share, those community conversations are a great way to uh, make a first contact with us, start talking to us, and then we have the whole spring and in some cases all through the summer um, to connect with you more, do a more formal oral history, get some filming. Um, you know, we, we want the community represented in this exhibition. Okay. All right, thank you. you. If you have anything that's more of a snippet in the um, chat, I put the share our stories uh, link so that if you wanted to type up a, a story or two that was especially um, you know, strong for you or you only have a couple, um, you can send it in through that also. And next week's community conversations are gonna to be totally different from this. Everyone's mics will be off. Um, again, I'll be asking a couple of questions, but I'll be quiet for most of it, and we want to hear what you have to say. Um, they will be recorded, um, they will be archived, um, so you have to make sure you're willing to share what you want to say publicly, um, but it's a, a great opportunity for you to share your stories. All right, thank you all. Good night.